Good day, listeners. Good day, Mr. Nelson. Firstly, allow me to express gratitude for assigning me the best story in our world of prose. And I mean, it's not a competition, but let's just be honest. If we had to choose, Emma by Caroline Cole is the only choice. My name is Dorothea Grant, and I am a student from the Northern Caribbean University. In order to pass my English literature class, I will be analyzing the elements of prose as it relates to Emma by Caroline Cole. But because I only have 15 minutes, let me just move right along into analyzing some quality content. In case you have never heard the story of Emma before, I will be using the plot diagram to summarize this story. So feel free to pause the video on any slides to read the details of the story. In the exposition, the story opens with a game between Dory and Emma coming to an end. The idea of games becomes the background to the plot, which is told from the innocent perspective of Dorian York, an eight-year-old girl who believes that all adults are simply playing a game of grown-ups. She tries to understand the game to play it with Maria, who is her best friend. She's nine years old and wiser than she is. However, she misunderstands most of what the adults say and do. The setting moves from the York's house to the mall to the train station and Georgia Avenue. We also meet Maria's short, shady single mother, Mrs. Robinson, who often upsets her daughter. Granddaddy is mentioned in a flashback when he visits the family and his presence reduces the tension briefly. Jack York, Dorian's, Dorian's distant father, is described as a player who has an affair with the lady at the train station. And finally, Emma, the black-haired woman that the children idolize and try to model themselves after. Emma hurriedly calls the children for them to go downtown with Mrs. Robinson to the mall to purchase items for school. Rising Action A occurs from the moment the mothers are observing the skaters and the children decide to join them. Through the dispute between Dorian and Maria and when Ruby begins to pry into Emma's life. In Rising Action B, the uncomfortable conversation continues. There is great, there is a great toast by Ruby to rich men and their mistresses, and the spilling of water all over Emma as she pulls her glass away. Mrs. Ruby continues to meddle, becoming verbally aggressive as she emphasizes that Jack is a player. She stuns the children when she uses inappropriate language, but Emma shuts down the entire conversation. In Rising Action C, she, was gi she gives the children gifts and allows them to go to the old train station that Dory requested. Dory asks Maria about the term player, but her knowledge is also limited because she only knows the term from games like baseball and cards. The climax, the climax begins when the children see the lady at the train station. The mothers appear and Ruby points out the affair to Emma who screams and runs away. Dorian, Jack run af Dorian and Jack run after her but she pulls away and runs into the street where she dies. The action falls in two phases. Firstly, with the loneliness of the home and Maria attempting to be like Emma to comfort Dory. However, Ruby threatens to send them away and then when the children are sent away after Dory witnesses Ruby and Jack in her parents bedroom so they send the children to St. Agnes house but not before the children turn to see their parents kissing and finally the resolution Dory resolves that she may not want to grow up after all because of the complexity of the grown-up games. She then comforts Maria like Emma used to and tells her they will play the game better than their parents. Maria smiles and the two make plans for what they will do when they reach St. Agnes' house. Allow me to talk about the conflict in Emma. The conflict in Emma is external. More specifically, man versus man, or dare I say, woman versus woman. The characters are directly opposing each other, right? Firstly, there's Maria versus Tori, Jack versus Emma, Emma versus Ruby. They're all, uh, Maria and Dory, they're always finding themselves in conflict because only one of them can be Emma in their little game of grown ups. According to the text, Maria and I got into another fight. 
she wanted me to be her mama because I'm short like her mama. Page 52. They then break into a violent fight. Mrs. Robinson is probably one of the most dangerous types of friends I can imagine. While their children fought with fists and words, Mrs. Robinson and Emma played a game of mental manipulation. Their fight was subtle, but it was revealed in their dialogue and it was, to me, it was more intense. From the very start, we know that Ruby has knowledge about the lady at the train station. As the story progresses, we learn that she also has an attraction for Jack. She manipulates Emma into going to the train station as the text says, Mrs. Robinson wanted to come by the train station and pick us up. Page 53. Ruby and Emma are direct contrast in personalities. They have very different perspectives which explains most of their conflict. In regards to the internal conflict, um, that also exists in the story, specifically man versus self. We see Dory having an internal conflict with herself and her desires to tell her mother about the lady at the train station. She says on page 50, it just seems to me that Emma should know who has the little joker. The story Emma by Carolyn Cole addresses so many issues and so many themes are brought out from desires to connection to women in society. However, the theme I will be developing is infidelity. A theme in the story Emma by Carolyn Cole is infidelity. Jack's infidelity with the lady at the train station greatly impacted his relationship with his wife and ultimately led to her death. An example of this could be found when Emma is anxiously waiting for Jack to return home and the difference in their reaction to seeing each other. According to the text, she was so happy to see him, she acted like a puppy licking and kissing his face. He was sort of happy to see her, but not happy like when he sees the lady at the train station. Page 50. Hmm. This evidence suggests that their relationship was strained or even one-sided and Jack was not reciprocating the love that Emma portrayed. He found more joy in meeting his mistress than his wife and daughter at home and this no doubt would have affected their marriage. Another example that demonstrates this theme could be found when Emma goes to the train station, sees Jack with the other woman, runs away and then sadly gets hit by a car. According to the text, she was crying, crying real hard. She, she snatched away from him and ran into the street. I don't know exactly what happened. Her face was real bloody. It didn't look like mommy. Pages 56 and 57. This evidence literalizes the truth that infidelity does serious damage to the victims. Full stop. To summarize, infidelity can destroy relationships and it never promises a happy ending. We're quickly moving on to the setting of the story. The story takes place at the York's residence, at the mall, at the train station and of course, of course, Georgia Avenue where the tragedy occurs. The setting helps with the progression of the plot. Readers see a glimpse into Dorian's home life and how they operate in the home versus how they operate in public spaces, right? This adds to the use of contrast. This adds to the, to the theme of reality versus illusion, home versus public spaces. It begins in what's considered a safe space for children, right? The home. And it climaxes in the middle of the street. Georgia Avenue, a place not so safe for children. Nevertheless, the setting is not the central element of the story and there are not too many details about the setting. Thus, it is what we call a backdrop setting. But before I move off of analyzing the setting, you know, I was wondering to myself, why a train station? Why not a bus stop? The lady at the bus stop? <laughs> the lady at the market? No, the lady at the train station. So according to Linley 2019, the train station is a perfect place to pretend to be a different person. It is where we relax. However, I came to realize it's not so much about the train station, you know, um, as it is about the crossroads at Georgia Avenue. In literature, 
crossroads often represent a situation in which a character needs to make a crucial decision. Just as the character must choose a physical path, they must symbolically choose a life path. Ernest Hemingway. So Emma was literally at the crossroads. We're going to be now talking about characterization. I will not be characterizing each of the characters, only the protagonist emma york but here's a list of all the characters there's emma dorian jack ruby maria granddaddy and mrs watson what type of character is emma york well she's a round character according to simplified english 101 though she emma is the story's protagonist she has not changed typically we do not get to see the changes of round characters like Dory, if given the opportunity, Emma possibly would have changed. Her turning and walking away from her husband at the train station could have been the moments her change would have occurred, but uh, her life, it was taken away before that could have happened. Indirectly characterizing Emma, first of all, we know that Emma has black hair. It says so on page 52, Emma's black hair. Also, we know that Emma likes vegetable pie by Mrs. Robinson. On page 51, it says, it, I didn't really like them, but Emma and Granddaddy liked them a lot. So we know Emma likes that vegetable pie from her friend. In indirect characterization, we know that Emma had a beautiful smile. It says, Maria smiled. It was a nice smile like Emma's smile. Page 58. Now with this, it's comparing Emma's smile to Maria's smile and that's how it brings out the fact that Emma had a beautiful smile. Secondly, it says on page 51, Mrs. Robinson never came over, but Emma sent vegetables to her. With this quote, we can uh, conclude that Emma is a kind person because it would only be a kind person that gives you something you don't really deserve, honestly. Mrs. Robinson didn't go to the home and help the family to cultivate the garden. Nevertheless, Emma saw it fit to send vegetables to her. So we know Emma is kind. We know she has a beautiful smile through indirect characterization. Now we're at language. I'm going to slow down a bit right here because there's some good content to analyze in the language of Emma. Examples of liter literary devices used in Emma are similes, suspense, contrast, metaphor, motives, symbolism, and flashback. The language of Emma is childlike, which is appropriate because the story is told using Dory's voice. Using incorrect grammar, such as me and Maria hugged Emma before we left, page 52, Caroline Cole beautifully captures the childlike voice. She also does this by utilizing similes. For example, when Dory sees Emma and Ruby talking with their heads close together, she says, It looks like they had one head with two colors, like Chabo, the downtown clown. Page 52. I believe that the comparison of adult life situations and behaviorism to things children are fascinated in emphasizes the point of view of the story, the theme of innocence, characterized by the narrator and of course it causes readers to understand how Dory's mind works for instance like most children her ideas are incoherent using flashback techniques we see her thoughts jump from past to future and then back to the present for instance when Jack arrives to meet the lady at the train station and hugs her Dory moves from describing what she sees to what she smells and then to a past experience she had with Maria and her mother's perfume. The swift transition in the thoughts of Dory characterizes the short attention span of eight years, eight year old um, girls quite accurately. All the childlike talk would be unappealing to adults if it weren't for Cole's impressive use of contrast, motifs, and symbolism. According to CSEC English Made Easy 2020, the motive of play appears to be a strong one, perhaps because the narrator is a young child. They literally see the life of adults as play. And Dorian confirms this at the end of the story, saying, I learned a lot about the game. When it's our turn, we'll play smarter. Cole, page 58. The symbolism of the cards, and specifically the Joker, the Joker card, is intertwined with the motive of play. According to L. Griffith, 
Photography 2021, cards are symbolic of the game of life. Joker represents chance, and the mother's life could have gone in a different direction had she chosen Mrs. Robinson's advice. Furthermore, she says, Mrs. Robinson gave Emma an alternative way of playing the game to keep her player husband. Interesting, right? This refers to when Ruby asks Emma, why don't you have a second child on page 53? She continues to say, Emma's refusal led to her demise and Mrs. Robinson's success. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. We're going on to the dialogue, the use of dialogue. Dialogue um, provides information, background information. For example, we know that Emma sacrificed much for her relationship with Jack through her conversation with Ruby. Mrs. Robinson said, I can't tell he has given up anything if he seems to me. It seems to me you've given up everything. Page 56. Secondly, dialogue, in, uh, dialogue also demonstrates to us the conflict and reveals how characters interacted. For example, the infidelity of Jack is further developed by the conversation Dory overhears. She would ask, only me? Daddy said, you're the only woman in my life, Emma. Page 50. As readers would know, this is not true and so the tension and conflict are heightened as we witness Jack deceive Emma. We see how they interact in what they think is a private conversation. The points of view, points of views, points of view filters everything in a story. The story Emma is written in first person singular points of view through a child narrator, the child being Dory. This evident um, this is evident by the use of pronouns like I and me in the sentence me and Maria held Emma before we left but I still didn't feel good about leaving her. Dory does her best to narrate what she sees but through her innocent eyes she mis misinterprets many of the realities that adults try to hide from children. For example, let's talk about when Dory was eavesdropping on her parents, right? She says they would talk some more and then the bed would squeak a lot. Readers may realize that her parents are having sexual intercourse. However, this goes whoops, right over Dory's head. Due to the fact that children misinterpret so much, first-person child narrators are often seen as unreliable. The role of this perspective is to imitate views of how she sees her mother, feels about situations, it shows readers the games adults play and how their actions affect children and it gives readers a glimpse into the volatile relationship of her parents. This type of narrator is able to control the author's reach over the reader's view. Now the audience is not explicitly stated by the author, Carolyn Cole or any other credible sites. But we can make an educated assumption that Emma's target audience is women. One of the major themes in Emma is women in society. And because many characters like Emma, Ruby, Maria, even the lady at the sta the, the lady at the train station being women or female children observing women, there is a strong appeal to women in this story. An important conversation in this story is when Ruby and Emma are making a toast to different women in society. Ruby toasts to rich men and their women of leisure. But Emma dramatically pulls her glass away and instead says, Better yet, let's drink to ambitious women who bleed men dry. This isn't to say that the story should only be read by women or girls. There is an important feminist conversation that this book encapsulates. The oppression of women is no joke and the results are catastrophic on the family and community. With conversations and themes like the ones I just mentioned, there is much that both men and women can learn from Emma about relationships, feminism and playing the game of life. Imagery! Imagery makes the story more visual, exciting, engaging to the readers. For example, in the scene where Dory witnesses her father's affair, we are transported 
transported to the train station through our nostrils. The olfactory imagery is described on page 56 when the text states, I smelt perfume all over the train station. And later she said, it made me sick. Through this imagery, we can imagine how suffocated and disgusted Dory feels. Or let's look at the visual imagery. In, in um, when the scene, the scene where Emma dies. When I read it, since then it has literally stayed in my mind. Like my dreams. <laughs> I began, since, ever since I began this research. The imagery is just, it's so undeniable. Everything was scattered on the streets. My cards were everywhere. I started counting, looking for all of them. The last one was lying beside mommy's hand. The little joker. Bloody. She was lying there like a broken doll. Page 56. I mean, literally, you cannot tell me that after reading this quote, you did not fully see the entire scene through Dory's eyes. You're seeing it. Imagine if she just got straight to the point and said, Mommy lied there dead. That would be less of an experience or less of a build up to the final reveal that, okay, Emma was um, dead. Both examples utilize simile in creating the imagery and it's just perfect and appropriate and highly effective in putting the readers on the experience with the characters. Now, let me allow me to just calm down for a second from this very exciting story so that I can I can conclude the video analysis and show you my preferences. These are my references. And now I'd just like to conclude by saying Emma is the best story in our world of prose. Full stop. If all the evidence that I gave a while ago, if the analysis of the point of view, the audience, the imagery, the plot structure it was not enough to convince you then i'm not sure where where i went wrong because emma is just so detailed and carolyn cole did an exceptional job in getting her point across and reaching her audience thank you for listening have a good afternoon